Thanks for tuning in to the HR Uprising podcast. I'm your host, Lucinda Carney. The HR Uprising is focused on helping forward-thinking people professionals deliver real lasting value in their organizations. I'm a chartered psychologist, speaker, and trainer, and recently authored the best-selling business book, How to Be a Change Superhero. My day job is founder and CEO of software and training business Actus. This gives me the opportunity to work with other businesses like yours. We are focused on building a better workplace for people wherever they are located with the help of our performance, learning and talent management software and our training and consultancy services. Every week on the podcast, I will be covering different topics and challenges joined by relevant experts and real life people professionals. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoy and get value from this week's episode. Hello and welcome to this week's HR Uprising podcast. And this week I've got a lady with me who's a speaker on leadership and productivity and is the author of a book which is a winner at the Business Book Awards, which I think has got an absolutely fantastic title. It's called The Crazy Busy Cure. How relevant and topical is that for so many of us? So I've got Zena Everett with me today. Hello, Zena. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, I mean, it is one of those things we've got this whole sense that people are getting busier and busier, um, more work than than we can throw at us, despite the fact that many of us are working in a hybrid setting and in theory we've claimed time back, feels like we've filled it so people are busier than ever and possibly even more stressed than ever and are they more productive? Those are all questions that I've kind of been musing on myself, which is why I was so delighted um, when I saw an article you wrote about that um, and uh, and you kindly sent me a copy of your book so that I could read your thoughts on it. So it, it seems incredibly topical. I mean, just in terms of, before we go into a few sort of, areas of advice what what brought your interest in this topic what made you write a book on this it's not your first book is it no it's my second book but I I wrote a book called mind flip take the fear out of your career which is a career manual but I know I got so I I coach and I would help people you know if you think about business being forecast, strategy, or plan, execute, coaches get involved at the planning stage, don't we? And then, but particularly at the execution stage. So I'd say to somebody, hey, how's that laser focus we talked about on your plan? And they'd say, yeah, Zena, I don't do any of that. I, you know, I come in with great intentions and I, you know, I'm, I'm in the office before everybody else. That's great. But then I spend my whole day playing whack-a-mole with somebody saying, have you got five minutes? And what about that? And this is urgent. And, oh, can you do this? And this project and this meeting and all these other things. And people kept saying all the time, they're crazy busy, like it was a bit of a badge of honor. And they would just say, come back four o'clock. If they were lucky, they'd got back to where they were at eight o'clock that morning. But usually they were just running all the time and never catching up. And when they did their real work, and my clients are all knowledge workers, so they're paid for their brain power, you know, they would they would have to kind of steal time over the weekend. And I just heard this all the time. So I became really interested in this whole area of productivity and productivity drag and the organizational factors that get in the way of getting things done and like I'll stop talking a minute Lucinda because I can go on <laughs> Don't worry. Said because to kind of loop back my first job is I used to have a recruitment business and I'd written a career book and my first the first lesson you learn in recruitment is that if the job description's not right the placement's going to fall apart because people can't make up what they're supposed to be doing and what they're measured on. And then in a wonderful loop on crazy busyness, I realized that actually, if people don't know exactly what they're, what they're going to be measured on, they're crazy busy. And that sounds really obvious to you and me because you're, you were both in the trade and also we're entrepreneurs. So we know where the money is and what yeah. we should be doing and what we're measured on. But when I talk to people about their what they do all the time and I say, are you crystal clear on what a good job looks like? You would maybe not, but I think you'd probably be really interested in how many people say, 
Mm, not sure because I'm in a matrix environment. I've got several different bosses. My new boss has set all the horses running with all these different projects. Or I've just been here for a long time. So as well as HR, I'm also doing a little bit of marketing. You know, I'm also kind of got facilities and I've kind of got comms. And, you know, so so actually it's all a bit murky. Real so, blur priorities. That isn't it, and I guess that's so interesting because you got it from a coaching point of view. Because that's exactly you're working with people; they're investing that time, coming up with yeah. this really great clarity about what they're going to do, walking out with motivated with an action plan, and then the stuff, the crazy busy stuff, stops them from executing it, um, yeah. or they allow it to stop them from executing. Which I guess is is where you go with that, and lots of things you came up with there. I think we'll explore over the um, over the course of the podcast. But I suppose before we go into that. Would you say that there are certain personality types? Um, you know, is it is it a, an individual sort of nature thing or is it more of an environmental nurture thing which creates people being crazy busy? If we park the thing about job descriptions and things, which I think we both agree is is a relevant point for people. Do you see personality plays a part as to whether you are going to have more of a predisposition to getting crazy busy? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm always saying, look, it's not just a personal um, thing. It's a systemic challenge. But most definitely some of us, you know, that great Marshall Goldsmith, what got you here won't get you there book, which I use all the time as a when I do group sessions with people is you realize, you know, you you're in a business partnering role. You can't partner everybody equally. You've got to know hate that stakeholder world but you've got to know who your priority people are as well you can't please everybody and you know we all get that dopamine hit of dealing with an email you know somebody shouts at us and we just our monkey brain gets rid of them don't we because they could you know they could eat us up and so we can spend our time just batting off queries from not significant people and not really working on the well, that old cliche, the important, not urgent stuff. So there, there's an element of that. And, and I think it's got worse for all of us since hybrid working because we're in front of a screen and we're tired and our energy sapped. And so sometimes it's hard to see the wood for the tree. So I'm really, without sounding like an old dinosaur, I'm saying to people, you know, you need your agile daily startups just where even if, you know, we're saying to somebody, this is what I've got to get done and this is when I can do it. It's that's not and that's not micromanagement. I think people are really nervous about micromanagement. For me, that's management. So you so, say actually having that because of the the sort of blurring and everything. Yeah. Got knowledge workers working from home a lot of the time because it, it it does kind of all blur into one. That kind of right. This is what I'm going to do t- today. The, the accountability, that sort of focus on a, on a weekly or daily basis is is a way of helping people feel really productive and get on top of things. Yeah what you said so brilliantly absolutely right and then within that there's the old psychologically safe environment where they where people feel safe to have that conversation but also um feel safe to say look why are we having this meeting at nine o'clock on a monday because nine o'clock on the monday is my kind of monk time when i want to get on with the work not talk about it and just because we've always done it this way it's not working for us in 2023 so I think that's where the culture comes in where it also has to feel safe and so safe to say I'm feeling really busy or I want to talk about what I'm going to do at a different time or even say I feel I'm not clear on what my priorities are you've just landed something on me what what is the top priority type thing and safe to say let's safe to say let's have a conversation about meeting etiquette email etiquette teams you know, Teams was never invented for us to be on it 24-7. It's kind of like vaping. We didn't realise it was going to be so addictive. But Microsoft didn't make team for us to just use it judiciously at certain points in the week. It, uh, you know, so pe- for people to say, do we need to be on Slack all the time? Do we need to be on Teams? Why do we, by default, have WhatsApp groups for all these different things? Because all we're doing is just they're just distractions, so, yeah. and that, but that's but, your whole dopamine hit thing, isn't it? So maybe circling back to um, personality types in terms of that. So I can see that that's one of the areas where I think my biggest time wasters are, and that is a bit of the dopamine hit is a click on another WhatsApp or a communication or something that's coming urgently. I'd have more of a draw towards that. 
and I would have to learn to well in fact I you'll be aware of this the classic there's a study about um, mobile phones that if you can even see it in your peripheral vision you're it's you're distracted you're having to use lots of um willpower to avoid it so i have to hide my mobile phone i'm so much more productive it's really bizarre i definitely see that as the top tip for anyone who's not heard of that i hide it behind my computer so i can't see it and i don't yeah. have that temptation to pick up and check on whatsapp and lose time scrolling so that would be a bit of a personality trait that i know i have a bit of a, a dopamine addiction piece but then in your book you also talk about um certain traits about people who are a bit more who might be more tendencies that we think you said perfectionist you're someone who likes to do it yourself so maybe a little bit of maybe that's linked to perfectionism and, and controlling stuff and also people who not the nice people who are very unselfish who don't like to say no to others um those those i say i can see those are personality traits to a, a degree um mm. those sort of things do you want to talk a little bit about the impact of that do you see that in your coaching clients that they would have more of a tendency to to be crazy busy totally <laughs> yeah I mean all all the reasons that you said and I think we get to a certain level in our lives where we try and keep everybody happy but it's very hard to do even an in individual contribution these days with all the all the digital demands on us um, never mind manage other people, never mind complex stakeholders and everybody saying I need this and I need that. Yeah, so most definitely you have to be. I mean, ruthless comes up a word in sessions. And, you know, when I do um, work with teams, there's always somebody that says, oh, I don't do that. You know, why are you doing that? Send it back to them. Why are you telling somebody what their holiday entitlement is when we can log on and they can log on and find it out for themselves? You know, you, you just so there will be people in a team I mean, I hate to go down a gender rabbit hole, but it's, uh, you know, I do say to people, if you're a man, what would you do? And they go, oh, for goodness sake, well, I would do, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd be saying no to that. We kind of laugh about it. It's a very brutal, you know, but um, I think there are always people in a team that try and please everybody. And there are other people that think actually, you know, from my career perspective and my next performance review, what is it I want to say I've done? And does my diary reflect it? And if it doesn't, then they do something about it. But you've got to have that longer term vision, haven't you? You've got to be looking at several cars in front on the motorway and think, OK, I have to really think, what is it I want to achieve here? What's my legacy? What do I want to be proud of? And actually just doing all this small stuff isn't working for anybody. So yeah, it's the big rocks and uh, it, it, putting the big rocks in first, the cover analogy, isn't it? I suppose the green pebbles, I always remember that, which you can you can have a day at the end of the day, you've been busy all day and you've achieved absolutely, you absolutely nothing. That's that's the, the challenge. So it's but it's really tricky, though, for some people who are naturally um, unselfish or perfectionist because you're actually going against the grain almost. So they have to be aware of it. And I was thinking also with the gender thing, the reality is particularly um you know with hybrid working quite often if it is the females they have also got the kids that, that you know they will be taking shouldering the burden of out of work yeah. um pressures yeah. too so it's an yeah. extra bit of juggling that is an is an absolute reality for people um in terms of sticking with it in the workplace though stuff that you can control in the workplace because definitely you can prioritize at home and maybe you can have stern words with other people who can share the um responsibility outside of home but sticking in the workplace because we we were talking about this with performance and I say I came across your work through an article that you wrote about um a, a, you know someone who'd been a really high top performer and then they had gone off the boil and that resonated with me because that's um fitted with something that I'd been working in the business um and I just noticed that when we were talking about underperformance which incidentally underperformance is one of our most downloaded any of the stuff we've done under for people download it's, it's, it's a pain point for people my an unscientific observation over the last three to five years is that underperformance is no longer seen as sort of, I don't know, uh, gross misconduct or something more traditionally and overt. It's much more subtle and it feels much more like people have just got, a, they've just gone off the boil. Um, whether they're worn out, they're judged, whatever it is, it's not a case of them doing something wrong. So is it confusion or is it burnout? But it's that kind of thing that I'm seeing. And that's what you wrote in your article. And I was interested as to how that fits into this whole concept mm. and also what can we do about it mm. well it's 
it's overwhelmed. That's what I wrote about is it was a genuine case study of somebody who had been a great performer. And um, because they were really good at what they did, um, other teams would go directly to them and say, oh, look, we want you involved in this. And, you know, classic stuff. Um, and they were overwhelmed and they just didn't know where to begin. And we know when people are like that, then they you know, it's inertia. We've all seen those programs, with Graham, uh, Gordon Ramsay going to restaurants, hasn't he? And saying, well, no wonder no one comes in because you've got way too much stuff on your menu. Take it off. You know, Marks and Spencer's, what was that, Peruna or whatever they called it. I used to go in there and think, I don't, I can't cope and walk straight out again because it's overwhelming. So we might like the choice, but we don't buy. And it's it was the same case, I think, when people have got too much to do. But, you know, something you just reminded me, actually, is that... Um, I'm working with businesses quite a lot on saying, you know, let's put it, you know, basic, what's the purpose? What's the so what? Why are you actually doing this job? Why do you come to work? There's all these different things that you could be doing. But actually, ultimately, it comes down to your client, you know, your client, your member, your patient, your stakeholder, what are the reason why you actually do what you do? And I think sometimes, um, particularly now, you know, post-pandemic, hybrid working when people are tired they need that shot on the arm again actually of just saying let's just remind ourselves of what's really important and why that's important and I like my managers who I'm working with to start meetings like that you know with the real overarching purpose let's just remind ourselves of what we're here to do and when people have got their purpose now that could be their own values actually I'm here to do this job and then you know have a clean break at five and have a meal with the kids if that's one thing or actually just from when people know what their purpose is they're a lot less crazy busy because they're more purposeful actually if you know I'm doing HR in a school does this make life better for the teachers or the pupils yes which one of these gets there quicker this one well that's what I'm going to do so I think again 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 it all comes down to good leadership doesn't it and kind of reminding clarity of purpose and putting that back in so it is people so we have responsibility ourselves saying you know where are we going to go here or what's this or how does this fit into my role or to where the business is going but also as leaders to to communicate that and I guess be prepared to be challenged if we say you know because I'm mm. guilty of saying oh that's important that's important that's important that's important lots of things yeah. are important but not not everything can be equally important so helping yeah. to prioritize yeah, well, so, you know, they they need that organisational clarity, they need to be competent to be able to do their job. And then, of course, that's when you bring in inquiry driven leadership in a psychological safe environment. So then it's trusted for, for a manager to say, what have you got on your plate? When are you going to do it? What's most important? What matters most? Let's just to ask those questions. So I do, I, do, I don't know if you're seeing this, but I'm kind of seeing a certain amount of kind of learned helplessness in some businesses I work in where people are tired. They've got that, oh, well, you know, it's always like this. What can I do? Because they're tired, too much Zooming, too much screen time, not enough fresh air yeah. and so they've lost that sense of agency so I'm spending half my time with leaders saying right you're not crazy busy now what are you okay you're a leader as coach you're asking those questions you're pushing back that energy and that accountability and empowerment in so then people feel empowered to make their choices themselves but at the moment I think we're in that parent child relationship where you know people are almost Spoon feeding is unfair, but I think you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I think the learned helplessness is, is true. It, it's definitely something you can where someone might ask a question about doing something that you'd kind of say, well, use your common sense. You've been doing this job for a certain amount of time. What do you think you need to do? And I mm. guess as a leader, you can perpetuate that problem by answering it. So being a coach is a better way of doing it. So, so what do you think you need to do? You have the answers, causing people to think. But equally, um, it is interesting. Why do people get there? Is that just we don't have the space to take a step back and go, OK, what do I to think anything other than immediately short term in front of your face? I think um, a lot of the I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but certainly the organisations I've been working in have done an amazing job over the last couple of years of taking care of their teams. 
And I think that compounded with the way that we work and how tired and overwhelmed and all the other stuff, plus a bit of people pleasing, plus a bit of trying to have a perfect life. So to make it kind of Instagram worthy, this whole thing has made a big kind of cocktail or soup or whatever <laughs> food metaphor you want of, of people feeling, oh, you know, it's just all it's just all so difficult and they've lost that sense of entrepreneurial spirit yeah. I suppose yeah ownership and stuff I thought it's all a bit meh I thought I was going to say it feels a bit meh sometimes doesn't it <laughs> it's all a bit meh and then you know we all know about content how up to 1900 content doubled every 100 years didn't it or knowledge now we don't have knowledge we've got content and that's doubling daily I mean that is you know we all we all know that and we say it glibly it's doubling daily so people have to you know swim through this to your point on the mobile phones apparently I mean this is University of Virginia research I mean you've done loads of research <laughs> I know I mean, there's just amazing amounts of research you think I could have told them this you just had to ring me that if you'd see something on your phone you know that wretched parents whatsapp group anyone seen this jumper we do two other things before we go back to what we're doing and that's a big part in this whole productivity problem is that we're just switching our attention all the time. So that lost 25 minutes is kind of OK while we're going down that rabbit hole of the lost jumper and then the other things. And then there's the news feed and, you know, but when you compound that over a week and over a month and over a year, we're not helping our country's productivity problems, are we? Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So we can blame lack of resource and all those sorts of things. And then you also think the amount of time we're spending in meetings. And I, I'm sure you see this, that people had loads of meetings during the pandemic, but they've kept that cadence up now that we're back. So people have literally no time to work, do they? So, that, so that's the other thing that people say, well, I'm in meetings all day. Yes. I did one HR team in particular who were saying you know they were so lovely and they were just right at the end of their tether and we've made them say right we are available every day from midday so they've signposted as a team we're available so some of them are in some of them are not in and all that kind of thing but we're available we can help you now clearly if there's a genuine drama before midday of course CEO wants them there on it but generally speaking, so they didn't say we're not available these times because I ju they just couldn't do it because that wasn't in their nature, quite rightly. So they're making a big point of saying when they are available. So they had a few hours in the morning to actually do the work. And that worked for everybody because they felt more in control. It was a great message for the organization. And people would also think, oh, I'm going to look, I'll have to look at my own holiday entitlement then. And all the kind of petty things that they were bothered with. So, so, that's, so that was uh, an HR team, you're saying, that were feeling really, really busy because presumably, and, and it is interesting, obviously, we've got an HR audience here. Often people do come and come at you from all angles and you have got a real, really diverse, especially if you're in a HR department of one, isn't it? If you're, you know, the single HR person in a small business, you're, you're you, know, pre, you know, talking to someone about this, you're recruiting here, you're talking to the CEO about strategy there, you're doing a policy there, you're dealing with a grievance. You've got so many hats and so much juggling. How on earth do you ever see the wood the trees all? Yeah, that's no wonder you're never going to get your HR strategy written, are you? So what they're saying there is um, they're not saying that they're not available so blocking it out but they're saying i am it's a nice kind of positive message is available between the hours of 12 and 4 yeah, so like the, it influences that mornings are not drop-in time so hopefully people serve themselves but that gives them some headspace and some actual space to get the job it. done you've got it exactly right and it's a productivity is a spectator sport i think people look specifically for hr to think yeah, yeah, they're, you know, I mean, if God, if HR aren't in control of their time, if HR is stressed, there's not much hope for the rest of us, is there? So they've got to walk yeah. the talk to a certain extent. So, and it's yeah. harder because I think they've actually got, uh, uh, the only other area of a business I'd say is harder uh, uh, than that is a customer services kind of rip role where you're having to, you're almost forced into being reactive, uh, reactive because it is quite, they haven't actually got time control. But again, in those environments, you must, Maybe that's if you're the manager or a team leader of somebody in that environment. How do you help people ring fence out some of the time to do the other stuff other than just reacting? Which, of course, this does get back to knowing the purpose of the role. So knowing the purpose of the role, but also giving people um, you know, the time to achieve 
what they need to do within within that role. Yeah. And and also there's something, I mean, easier said said than done because I don't do the job, but there is also something about simplifying this, you know, having lots of FAQs, having uh I'm just trying to think about somebody I work with and they had all these templates sent up so if somebody asked them something they could cut and paste something in their signature and you know send it over so there's also something but you know that all takes time doesn't it I think how, yeah, that's how a I classic do? I think that's a really brilliant example and so I think when I've been, and brought people in we talked offline and about the fact that I used to train on seven habits which is well, the t- time management bit of that was always about quadrant two time, which is the not urgent but important time. If you spent more t- time in that area, then you have less urgent but important yeah. time. So that the classic catch 22 is people go, oh, I haven't got time to write the yeah. FAQs document because I'm too busy answering the FAQs time after time after time after time. And it's like it, that's where that's a mindset thing, though, for me is going, you've got to if you ever you're never going to get out of that cycle unless you put some time in to to break it um and that and that means putting yourself forward that goes personality yeah, no, that means being selfish if you like in order to be a better um, hr professional whatever it might be um to invest there the business that you know that ultimately that's the purpose of our job isn't it to to serve the business but um i worked or i spoke to an insurance company recently um and they'd introduced something called um jury service which is essentially a sprint but they said if somebody comes to them and says i, I need to do those faqs or sort this system out once and for all because it's such a big productivity problem so i want to stop everything they call it jury service because like jury service where you've got to go you've got to yeah. hand over it, you've yeah. got to do it you can't argue and the and the sky doesn't fall in they do it and I think they've capped it at three weeks or something, but but they've said it, you know, it doesn't happen that often. Maybe somebody does it a few times a year, but they could really see the difference. Well, they take people ha- out. How does it work? So they go, this is to take everyone off the day job or whatever it is to do this project for two, three weeks. Yeah, I think they were talking about it. It was it was individuals that they tell me, but maybe they have small teams doing it. But yeah, they have a problem that needs fixing, and instead of trying to squeeze it around the size of the day job, it needs a sprint. But they called it sprinting, and people are a bit like, "Yeah, okay," but I've still got all these emails. When they called it jury service, it was lovely because people think, "Okay, I get the concept. I'm not here. I'm yeah. just not here." Yeah. So that's um, and they think that really works. That really works to solve those niggling problems. And it feels great, doesn't it? You know, you're a hero. That's really, and you can say, yeah, look, I've done this. And this is much better. These are the benefits for you. You know, well, it takes- that's a good point as well, isn't it? Because that also, if you then feel productive, like you're achieving tangible, meaty stuff, then then that is a great um, antidote for, for, for burnout. Because you go, oh, yeah, you know, we all feel much better when we're achieving something. The burnout a lot of the time is that mm-hmm. you're working so hard, you're running so fast, but you're not stopping to refuel or you don't feel like you're achieving anything. Right. Yeah, absolutely. In the same way that deep work feels great, because we're actually, as part from all the, the chemicals, we're doing something meaningful, aren't we? Actually, in- that's a really good, that, that's because that's, you talk about that in your book and the whole thing about getting into flow. And I think that, again, is something that if you can manage to have some time, let's say by ring fencing it, two or three times a week or daily if you can to get into the flow then that is also going to recharge you isn't it but it's easier said than done do you want to just explain a little bit about what you mean by that and how people might do it well flow which they call a a state of kind of hyper optimum concentration and back in my day we used to call it work or concentrating it's what when you're cramming for an exam and you're completely absorbed in what you're doing that's what we want to recreate at work, deep thinking, deep work, whatever you want to call it. And it releases dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, anandamide, norepinephrine, all these wonderful free legal highs. So, you know, all the other things we do to make work fun, you know, come in, there'll be kombucha and pizza and football tables and all that kind of stuff. All we actually, what we can do is say, hey, we don't need to work synchronously. If you need to do something, it's okay to be offline for two hours or 90 minutes or something. Just your head down and do it. And that is my plea to HR departments is just to think about how can we make that okay in work for people to actually get chunks of meaningful work 
done. So they do it once and they do it well. And as you know, when we're working in flow, because we chatted about this before we came online, but if you can do that, you get so much done than when you're stopping and starting. Okay. You know, it can be twice as long, can't it? Says me, like I'm writing my third book and I haven't done any of it today. <laughs> well maybe not today's not the day you hit, but you, tomorrow is another day but that, that is half the battle as well isn't it you can't necessarily do all of these things all of the time but and actually and you can't be I, I think you can't be in flow for all day if you mm-hmm. I was just think you know if you manage to have 90 minutes three times a week of really high quality flow time whatever that is you actually would make so much headway on what's really important but the reality is we often don't get that and if we have interruptions or interruptions interruptions that could be four hours to get that 90 minutes if at all so yeah. that's the tricky thing isn't it it's managing our environment both ourselves in terms of external and external interruptions or the pressure that we think people think that we're skiving um if we're not jumping on skype or whatever it is and as well as hiding the actual phone and things like that that do interrupt us in our day yeah, but it, it's again, it starts from the top, doesn't it? So if we're saying to our teams, you know, I've I've got to write those appraisals or whatever it is, that bit of policy. And I'm, you know, today I'm going to do that between 2.30 and 4.30. So if anybody needs me, I'm available between 4.30 and 5. And have you got everything you need before that? You do that often enough. It just becomes a habit. But if we are the crazy busy person and we're the bottleneck and we're slowing everybody down and we've got too much on the go and all those things and conflicting problems, then our team will think, oh, I've got to be on all the time. And if you, you know, going back to my beating the drum for dailies or agile stand ups or whatever you want to call them. You know, why not say or train our managers to say, OK, so, you know, what you, you know, what are you going to do today? And I say this, that. And then someone says, yeah, but I can see your calendar. I hate shared calendars, but that's another thing. Um, I can see your calendar and you've got meetings. When are you actually going to do that? I mean, it's really lovely for, for me to say, oh, I don't know. Actually, I was thinking about it, doing it when the kids go to bed. You know, that's the kind of conversations people are having yeah. and for the manager to say, right you know no you know let's look again when can you do it when yeah. can you actually find time in working hours yeah or so, do you need to be to all those meetings could you drop out of any of them either way yeah yeah is there an agenda for that meeting no okay so wait yeah. till there is an agenda cancel it does it need all of us no absolutely so um i think it's something we could talk about for a, for a long time there's so much great stuff in in this book it's packed a packed, um, full of quality content, this uh, this book, The Crazy Busy Cure. You can get it on Amazon. Um, Zena, any final tips, I guess? We've talked a bit about HR, ring fencing your time, <clears throat> making sure people, you know clearly what your priorities are, maybe, maybe making sure that people in the business have got clear job descriptions and know what their priorities are and you get them into the right job. Are there any other um, brief takeaways that you'd like to share with this audience before we wrap up? Um, look, gazillions, but you know what? Lunch, that's what I want to talk about is lunch. Bring back lunch. <laughs> Actually have a lunch break. Well, have a, have a lunch break. But I'm amazed by um, people going in the office and then they all have lunch at their screens and don't talk to each other. So I did a, I, I, a leadership programme with this wonderful business. It was a, um, oh, anyway, it doesn't matter what it was. But they had, uh, so I was working with all the different senior leadership team the woman that ran the operations department said, yeah, we're in three days a week. We have lunch together. You know, we just bring our sandwiches in and people come and go. And it's only about half an hour. We're not having candles and, you know. Um, And um, she said, it's just, I mean, it's all common sense stuff, isn't it, Lucinda? But she said that we've, you know, we just iron out all the nitty gritties. I can see if somebody's particularly on form or particularly not. And all their, you know, so I think I had to say I had a team of 10, nine of them were coming in, working through lunch, getting stressed, maybe taking the dog out or something because they were bringing dogs. It was like Battersea dogs home in there. But the one that was, you know, she was doing she did best on our engagement survey. She was getting all the best scores and she was operations. She was ironing out. She had quite a new team, ironing out all the new nitty gritties. And then she was saying to some of her senior colleagues, come and have lunch with us. Just come and chat so you know what we're doing. So sales were then talking to operations and thinking, all right, okay, how come? You know, it's kind of basic stuff. Sounds like the old days. (laughs) 
talk to people at the coffee machine, things like that, which seems, like you say, it's common sense, but that common sense isn't all that common is what they say, isn't it? No, I know. And, you know, there is, I just been rereading the Culture Code, that book, uh, and they were talking about Steve Jobs wanting to, and Pixar, moving the water coolers. So, you know, all that kind of stuff that, all the really expensive research and complicated stuff people do to think, how do we get each other talking? But I, I just see these people coming back in and they're, they're coming back into the office and they're not talking to each other. It's yeah, just... that seems like a real waste, doesn't it? Because if you are going to go back in, you might as well be sitting at your desk. If if you would, if you're not going to talk to anybody at all, have any of the passing information sharing, whether it's feel good, whether it's information sharing, whether it's creativity, any of those upsides, um, yeah. it seems like a missed opportunity. It really does, you know, for all sorts of for all sorts of reasons. So, and it's free, you know, it's a quick win and it's free. And also that point you made about bringing senior manager along, it's not just about us updating them, it's actually also about them being visible. That's engaging, that makes you part of the part of this. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of the other things, isn't it? That people felt that they don't have the career opportunities necessarily because the visibility is, is less when people Absolutely. are working remotely more so. Absolutely. So, I mean, you probably like me get, questions all the time about people are saying how do we how do we bring people back to the office they don't want to come and you think well that's management you've got to give them a reason yeah you and exactly like you said if, if you're having a bit of you're having a sandwich with the ceo in a very relaxed fashion you know you've got fomo if you're if you're not doing that i appreciate not everybody can do that for all those reasons but you know it doesn't have to be five days a week um, but yeah, but having something some of the time would definitely well. And again, that's that's freshening things up as well in terms of uh, recharging you in terms of our effectiveness. It's, it's it's breaking the monotony as well, which I think is one of the other things that affects people. Zina, it's been lovely having you on the the podcast. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, how would they get hold of you? Ah, oh, so oh seven nine six eight four two four six five zero. Pick up the. F- phone oh. but you can also email zena at zena um it's funny enough i'm really I, I i did a whole chapter in the book about aristotle what would aristotle say about about cat videos so i'm not on facebook i've got a lame instagram page i'm on linkedin but email or call that's what i like best so i run crazy busy sessions at keynotes and in organizations and team away days and stuff and and then i kind of often follow it up with some sort of um you know coaching building accountability fun stuff that's all you know that our grandparents could run but i'm doing it they're, they're not around to do it in, in, in lots of our cases in terms of um, what's your next book you said you're you're working on your third book what's that on uh it's um it's a book of coaching case studies actually so that so I send out a monthly I see oh I'm used it's that monthly mailing list you sign up for that on my website or put me an email and I'll, I'll put the link to your website on the, on the thank you so list. much that'd be great yes yeah, so an example of it because a couple of people said you need to write a book of your coaching case study so it'd be fun so at the moment it's called hot shot harry and toxic tina but i've got a feeling my publisher might want to do something i quite like that though i like that it's, it's like something that's like something that's snappy is good love it yeah okay all right thank you right on Zena, <laughs> lovely to have you. Thanks for coming on the HR Uprising podcast. I really hope you found this week's episode useful and enjoyable. If you did, perhaps you could recommend us to a friend or colleague or give us a review on your platform of choice. It really helps new listeners to find us. Now you can access links to any of the information mentioned in this show via the website www.hruprising.com. Further free resources are also available at www.actus.co.uk. There you can also find out more about our software and training solutions. Finally, why not join our LinkedIn group, The HR Uprising, to share ideas and collaborate with other like-minded people professionals. Thank you for listening to The HR Uprising podcast.